Father God, we thank you this morning. We bless your name because you are God. We thank you, Father God, because our confidence is in your faithfulness. We trust you from eternal past to eternal future. You are an unchanging God. And so, Father, we bless your name this morning. We thank you for this United States of America. We thank you for all of those who comprise of the citizens of this great country. Lord, I pray your blessings over every man and every woman. Lord God, we just had a very long, hard-fought election and emotions are high. But Lord Jesus, I just thank you that you rule and reign in the affairs of man. And Lord God, we honor you. We bless you that peace will reign in our land. My Lord God, we thank you that the days and months and years ahead are days and weeks and months that will glorify and honor you. Thank you, Father God, that you direct our steps. We walk in your wisdom, and we look unto you, the author and the finisher of our faith. Thank you, Father God. We honor and we bless you now in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. And we want to welcome you this morning once again to the service coming to you from Walkfine in Lawrenceville, Georgia. That's World Outreach Church for All Nations. And we trust that you've had a great weekend, and thank you for joining with us uh, allowing us to come to your space. We thank you, we bless you, and we pray that something that God will say this morning will, uh, will bless you, encourage you, and establish you along your ways in Jesus' name. And so if you have your Bibles this morning, please go with me to Daniel chapter 2, verse 21, Daniel 2, 21. And I'm using the NASB for this verse, Daniel 2, 21. It is he, referring to God, who changes the times and the epochs. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. Unless you've been living under the rock, something significant just happened over this last week in the United States. After all the long, hard-fought contest for this presidential election, all the phone calls, text messages, my God, I'm, I'm, I'm just glad the election is over. Yeah. All those robocalls and all that stuff, so it's all over now. And uh, we, 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 I just want to uh, make sure that you guys understand the result of this election. I know the emotions are very high. I saw yesterday celebration all over the streets, and that's good. That's fine. And in that saying, I want to congratulate the president-elect Joe Biden and his president, vice-elect uh, Kamala Harris. And uh, I pray that God will give them the wisdom and the understanding to, to uh, not only be in the office, but to do that which is righteous and just to the glory of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, having said that, and I'm going to get into the message uh, properly in a minute, having said that, I hope the result of this election is not lost to you. In all of our shouting and in all of the celebration, I hope the result is not lost to you. Now, because for all the poll stars and all the things they said, if you were to follow the poll stars, which by now, I should, they should all be applying for new jobs, <laughs> for how ridiculously wrong they were, but if you look at the result of this election, something is very, very clear. That the election may have been a referendum on the personality of the President of the United States, President Donald Trump. But the Republicans gained more seats in the House of Reps. Yeah. 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 As of the last count, seven, and potentially 12. So what that's saying to me is that this country is repudiating the far radical left agenda. So don't just bury your heads in the sand yeah, yeah. as you shout and jump and all that. So you need to understand what's at stake here. Amen? And at the same time, I, I, I really, I, I, you know, I don't want to shortchange or, uh, what's the right word here? Uh, it's important to acknowledge what this President Trump has accomplished. I know some of you may don't want to, you guys don't want to hear this. But it's the truth. 71 million votes? Yeah. That's not a joke. That's not a joke. So while the election has not been uh, officially sanctioned, because there are uh, things that have to be resolved by the courts, I don't want not to acknowledge, because if you look at the posters, it should not have gotten even 10 million votes. Yeah. 71 million. So what I'm saying to you is be patient, be calm, because those 71 million that voted for him had an expectation. Yeah. Therefore, it is his right, 
if he feels there was something that was untoward that happened with the elections, to go to the courts and see that address. So we, we must give that room for that. Because there are 71 Americans, like you and I, who had him as their choice. And we have to respect that. Yeah. Amen? So I just want to make sure we put things in proper perspective. Now, I may not have liked the language in which the election is challenged. Nevertheless, it is his right if he felt something was wrong to do challenge it. Do you guys get that clear? Yeah. Good. Now, back to the scriptures. I'm going to be speaking for a few minutes on epochs, empires, and dynasties. Because we need to understand what our role is in all of the things that's happening around us. Amen? The results of this week's election did not surprise God at all. And as Christians, we need to be reminded of the truth about God's sovereignty. Kevin DeYoung writes in one of his articles, he said that the story of the Old Testament is nothing if not a story of divine providence. On every page, in every promise, behind every prophecy is this sure hand of God. <laughs> he sustains all things. He directs all things. He plans all things. He ordains all things. He superintends all things, and he works all things after the counsel of his will. So even what's happening right now in the United States is not caught by surprise. He knows exactly what's going on, and it befits me and you as the church to key in to the mind of God and rather than speak out of our sentiment or emotions, we speak out of the Spirit of God. So while God could certainly rule and govern the earth without our participation, and that's the truth, he has chosen us to join him in ruling and governing his creation. So the title again this morning is Epochs, Empires, and Dynasties. Let me just define these words as I get into this message. Epochs refers to a period of time marked by distinctive features or events. Empires are a group of nations or people ruled by powerful, sovereign governments. And dynasties has to do with the sequence of rulers from the same family or stock. Now, having said that, let me go back to the scriptures in Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2, give me verse 21 first in the NKJV. Daniel 2, 21 in the NKJV. Thank you. And then I'm going to jump from there to verse 31 just to prepare you. Daniel 2, 21. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. Now verse 31. Verse 31. Now, let me just give the context here before I read these next few verses. In Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had a dream. And he uh, called on all the magicians in Babylon, the Chaldeans, and all the soothsayers. He told them to come. And without telling them what he dreamt, he wanted them to tell him what his dream was and then interpret it. Hello? <laughs> he wanted them to tell him what he had dreamt and then to interpret it. And all of them said, what a minute, king, nobody does this. Now, if you tell us your dream, we might be able to interpret it. But for us to read your mind and tell you your dream and then interpret it, say this, no, wait a minute, this is, no, this is above our pay grade, if you will. And one by one, they told him it's not possible, that only God can do that. And the king got furious, got upset, and told them to go and execute all of them summarily. And as they were carrying on the execution, Daniel came to hear or learn of what was happening and why they were killing all these magicians and soothsayers all over the kingdom. And he said, wait a minute, wait a minute, don't kill them all. 
Let the king know that I, Daniel, will seek God. God will tell me what his dream is, and I will tell the king. And the king said, oh, really? Oh, okay, you got to step to the plate? Go ahead. So Daniel prayed with his companions. And I, I cannot say this enough. For us, the church, our role is to pray and to hear the mind of God. So that when we open our mouth, we will not be speaking carelessly or speaking culturally or speaking out of our emotions. But when we are speaking to a nation or to leaders in authority, we should be, we should be speaking, thus said the Lord. And if the Lord said it, the Lord will back it up. Right now, you should know on both sides, those that heard from God and those that ate too much pizza. On both sides. So Daniel prayed, and God gave him the word. And in confidence, he went before the king. Now, you must understand that as we read this now, you, you have to know that if this guy didn't hear from God, and he dared to do what he just did, his head would be on the, on, on, on the ground. Verse 31. So now, here we pick it up. You, O king, were watching, and behold a great image. This great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you and its form was awesome. Okay? Its form was awesome, 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 awesome. Verse 32. This image head was of, gold, of fine gold. Its chest and arms of silver its belly and tides of bronze. Next verse. Thank you. Its legs of iron. Its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. Verse 34. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them into pieces. Next verse. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff, from the summer threshing floors, the wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. Can you imagine that? No trace was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Verse 36. This is the dream. Now we will tell you the interpretation of it before the king. Can you imagine that? It laid out the dream before the king. He said, now, king, this is the dream. Now, are, are you, are you still, king, are you still here? Because if you're still here, now let me tell you what it means. Yeah. Confidence. Yeah. Not all these people that just eat too much pizza and just uh, get into their sentiment and emotions and cultural background and start speaking nonsense. And the whole church is confused. The nation is confused. We don't know our left from our right, and we're fighting one another. Verse 37. You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And whoever the children of men, or rather, or, and wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand, and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of God. Now, notice this. Who gave this king all of this? Oh, you guys are not talking to me. Did this king just of his own accord have this kind of power or relationship? No. There's an acknowledgement here of who is in charge. You are this head of gold, verse 39. But after you shall arise another kingdom, inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bros, which shall rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that, cr that crushes that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Verse 41. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. 
Next verse. And as you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the, feet, with the seed of man, but they will not adhere to one another just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and a kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Last verse, verse 45. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, that great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain. You can tell your neighbor, say, the dream is certain. <laughs> And its interpretation is sure. And I can guarantee you, this is not because I ate pizza too much last night. <laughs> this is the sure word of the Lord. Now let me break it down for you. God was telling this very proud king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, what was about to happen. And according to this interpretation that Daniel gave him, we had several empires, if you will, listed here. Number one empire is the Chaldean Empire, which is also the Babylonian Empire, which Nebuchadnezzar was its head. When Daniel was given this prophecy, he was giving it personally, in person, to Nebuchadnezzar, who was the leader or the head of the Babylonian or Chaldean Empire which is modern-day Iraq. He was the head of gold. So after him was the Medes or Pe and Persian Empire, the Medes and Pe Persian Empire, which is uh, Egypt and Turkey and Iraq. Okay? They were the breast of silver. After that, was the Grecian Empire under Alexander the Great. That was the torso of brass. Next after that was the Roman Empire, which had the legs of iron. And don't forget, according to the scripture we just read, had 10 toes as well, which were partly iron and partly clay. Now, it is from this Roman Empire, I don't, I, don't, I don't want to go into all the history, and by the way, there are a lot more empires in the history of the world than what, than what we are reading here now. Those of you from Africa will remember the Ashanti Empire, you remember the Bono Empire, those empires were also there. But the, 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 the point here is, the scripture zeroes in on this to give us a message that God is trying to give, give to us, so we know how to live. Out of the Roman Empire, in more recent times, was both the British Empire which we, all of us remember that. It began with an overseas colonies, trading posts, and in the end, comprised dominions, protectorates, and mandates as well. Made, out of, made up of 13 million square miles of land, more than 20% of the Earth's land mass in 1922. The empire had a population of 450 million people, or about 20% of the global, global population. The financial burden of World War I was the beginning of the end of the British Empire. Now, why am I mentioning all of these things to you? Babylon, Medes and Persian, Greece, uh, Greek Empire, Roman Empire, and many more uh, smaller empires after the Roman Empire. You have the Portuguese, you have the Dutch, and then, of course, the British. Many of us will remember the British Empire, how large, how powerful it was at one time. Okay? Somewhere there, came forth the America, or if you will, the American Empire, or America the Great, America as a superpower. Birth out of the British Empire in 1945, as far, no, I'm not talking about the birth as independence, I'm talking about when we became a superpower. After the World War, 1945. 
and emerged after 1992 as the only global balanced power. That is, it was the only nation that could deploy economic, political, and military power on a global basis. Now, let's look at it again. Cardian Empire, Persian Empire, Grecian Empire, Roman Empire, British Empire, and now America the Great. Is the Chaldean Empire still functioning? Are, are, still, are they still relevant today? Okay. Is the Persian Empire still relevant today? <laughs> you guys are not talking. Is the, is, is the Greek Empire, Greece, are they still relevant today? Is the Roman Empire still relevant today? Is the British Empire still relevant today? If those empires came and are gone, and America right now sits at the place of what we call the global power, do you imagine or think that this will last forever? It's amazing when I began to think about this and pray about this that I have never heard a message in church to help us understand that America as we know it will not be as relevant forever. Everybody talks about this great nation and in this great and I thank God for America. I'm an American and I love it and I thank God for it. My wife is American, my children are American. America has blessed me. So you must understand I'm not here to repudiate America. No, I'm just here to wake us up. So we understand that our citizenry is not of American or British or Greek heritage. We are citizens of the kingdom of God. And if we don't understand that, we'll be like all of these kingdoms. That's here for a moment and just disappears. Listen. It is inevitable. God is not having an election on how long America will be in dominant war force. No. <laughs> Just as Babylon came and was gone, and the, and the Greek, and the, or rather the Persians came and they were gone, and the Greeks came and are gone, and the Romans. Each of these dominant powers, empires contributed their quota to God's plan, as America has done now. But I'm here to tell you, to warn you, to help you to understand it will not always be like this. Now, let me also say this. Let me, let me qualify that. I am not saying that America will be destroyed. No. Britain is not destroyed. It's still there. But then they stay there. They still have a good life. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Yeah. Rome is still there. What I'm saying is, this cocky arrogance of thinking the war ends or starts and ends with us, God will surely humiliate us until we take our rightful place and understand that our position, first and foremost, is to be citizens of the kingdom of God. That's when we can take the blessings that God has given us and use it to serve the world and bless the world. Because in verses 44 and 45 of Daniel chapter 2, the Bible says the stone came that was cut with that hand. Glory to God. In other words, this is God's agenda. It's not because I prayed, you prayed, you fast, I fast. No, it has nothing to do with that. God is working on an agenda, on a timeline, on a timetable. And this stone that was cut with that hand, that represents the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, is the stone which the builders rejected and has now become the head cornerstone. And the good news is, if you're a born-again believer, you don't have to look for a time yonder to come in 20 years, in 40 years, in 50 years. No. If you're a born-again believer, you are part of the kingdom now. <laughs> you must recognize your eternity already began. Because this kingdom 
of a stone cut without hands. Number one is divine in nature because it's cut without hand. Number two, we are told it will run forever. Eternal in nature. If you are born again, you're already in that. And number three, it will be, it will be without succession. Here in America, we're trying to grapple with an election. A president is, there's, we have a sitting president and an incoming president. That's an election. That's a succession. In the kingdom of God, there's none. Yeah. It's divine. It's eternal. And it was that succession. We don't have to go through uh, all this emotional turmoil every four years. No. Jesus is king today. He's king tomorrow. He became forever. Yeah. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Yeah. Now, what shall our role be in all of this? If we know that kingdoms are coming and they are going. And we know the kingdom of God has come. And we know that the kingdom of God is divine, is eternal, and is without end. What should our role be? Let's go back to that Daniel 2.21, the B part. Daniel 2.21. If you just give that to me quickly. Daniel 2.21. And it changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. Now look at the last part. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have an understanding. My problem and your problem for the most part is when we come to God, we come with our own agenda. We are not asking God, God, what do you want to see happen? How can I join you, God, in what you're already doing? No, that's, we don't pray like that. What we do pray is, God, I, I want uh, uh, Joe Biden to win the election. God, I want Donald Trump to win the election. We are telling God what to do. That is not wisdom. He says he gives wisdom to the wise. If, if I want to be wise, if you want to be wise, the correct thing is, God, what is your plan? What, what are you seeing? What do you want to accomplish? How can I join you, God, in what you already have in mind? That is, that is what the mind of Christ is. Having the thoughts, the feelings, and the purpose of God's heart. That is what, that's what it means. So that's where it starts. As believers, part of God's kingdom, we need to walk in wisdom. Number two, Number two, while God is sovereign, you and I are still responsible. We are responsible to live out our calling based on his design and desire. Let me say that again. While God is sovereign, we are still responsible to live out our life based on on the calling is given us on his design and desire. Okay, let me, let me break that down. In Genesis 1, 28. Genesis 1, verse 28. Look at what it says. Then God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the best of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. In other words, God made Adam and Eve stewards of his creation. So right now, as members of the kingdom of God, you and I will become stewards of God's creation. What, is, what does a steward do? A steward does not live to please themselves. A steward manages the affair of another. So what that means is, sometimes I may do things I don't really enjoy or like or prefer, but because I'm a steward, I defer to my master. <laughs> okay, I live that alone. We are stewards of God's creation, number one. And then number two, Ephesians chapter one in verses three and four. Give that to me the New Living Translation. Ephesians one, verses three and four. In the New Living Translation. Yep, even though God is sovereign, we still have the responsibility to live out our calling based on his design and desire. Okay, verse 3. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places because we are united with Christ. Now look at verse 4. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. So you and I were made before he even, he chose you and I before he even made the world. He has a design, he has a desire, 
and he has a purpose for you. And that design and desire is to steward his creation. Okay? Ephesians 2.4 says it like this. No, rather, Ephesians 2.10. Give that to me. Ephesians 2.10. Give that to me. Ephesians 2.10. Yes. There you go. Thank you. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. Why? So we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Long ago. What are those good things? We are created for good works. Not just what we do in church, that is important, we should do and function and serve in church, but not just that only, but also all the work we do in our families, in our communities, and especially in our vocations. Yeah. Folks, before you were ever born, before you were born again, before, before you became a believer, before you became a Christian, God had a plan for your life. Yeah. The moment you got born again, your born again experience was to bring you in alignment with God's plan for you. Not just to exist and say, I'm going to heaven. Yes, you will go to heaven. But before you get to heaven, what are you doing? How are you living your life? So you are born again to be brought into God's plan for your life. Because the Bible says in Ephesians 2.10, we are created for good works. Now, let me just say this. Number three, as believers, for those of us who are downtrodden, downcast because of the result of this election, perhaps your favorite candidate did not win, and you're upset, let me say this to you. Romans 8, 28. God is working out everything for your good because you love him and because you've been called according to his purpose, regardless of the outcome of the election. So I don't want you to be downcast, upset, and miss what God has for you because of your attitude. All things work out for good for those who love God and to those who have been called according to his purpose. And then we also need to pray earnestly for our president, whoever that may be. If you live in the United States, you live in England, you live in Germany, you live in Africa, wherever you may be. This is the role of believers worldwide. We are called to pray for our leaders. Not just pray for them, pray for them earnestly. Yeah. So we may live a good, quiet, and peaceable life. And lastly, lastly, you and I are called as ambassadors. We are world changers, and we must recognize that. We must live and walk in our identity. Look at Daniel chapter 1 in verse 8. Daniel 1, 8. Thank you. But Daniel, who is a believer in Babylon, okay, purpose in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the Enochs that he might not defile himself. This is a problem for many of us. Daniel refused to eat what the world was offering. He refused to participate and eat what the world was serving. Many of us do not have a God perception on anything except what we hear on Anderson Cooper, Sean Hannity, Joy Reid, those guys are your gods. They feed you daily. They say it, you believe it, and you're wrong with it. Daniel was in Babylon. He was in the king's court, which means there were some incredible meals. I, mean, I, I, I can only imagine what kind of meal they served. And he said, you know what? I know my identity. Because you know what? You are what you eat. Whoa. You are what you eat. If you just flip your channel and stop watching some of the wrong channels you're watching, you'll be surprised how quickly your political view will change. Yeah. You are what you eat. Rather than believe these pundits who are wrong time and time and time and time, and, and you keep on coming for more. Rather than believing them, read your word. Read the Bible. 
See what God is saying. Pray. Hear the voice of God. Daniel said, I will not eat of the food of Babylon. He refused. Because he recognized this principle. The principle of you are what you eat. And that's why Jesus said in John chapter 4, in verse 34, my meat, he says, is to do the will of him that sent me. What is your meat this morning? Another translation says, my food, my sustenance, what keeps me going, what gives me strength, my source is to do the will of him that sent me. What is your source this morning? What is your source? As ambassadors and world changers, we are called to change the culture of our world and not be changed by the culture they are imposing on us. If you find yourself constantly changing to the world's message, something is wrong with your Christianity. I'm sorry. Me and you are called to challenge the status quo and bring to bear on our culture, on our environment, the culture of the kingdom of God. And that will only happen when we eat this food. Man shall not live by bread alone, Jesus says, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That, that's what needs to happen. So, my closing shot here is we need to cut through. We need to cut through all the noise of the TV pundits and the social media soothsayers. And remember that God is on the throne. And none of us can say to him, what have you done? None of us can say that. And so, Father, this morning we want to thank you for our time together. Once again, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for this great nation. And while we do that, we recognize that you are in control of the affairs of men. And that just as the Greeks and the Romans and the British and all other empires before us came and left, we know that you have a timeline, timeline for America. So we will not be sucked into the so-called American dream. But we want to be sucked into your dream. Yeah. Your dream for us is what we desire. And that's what we embrace. Yeah. And we say, Lord Jesus, thank you that your kingdom come now and that your glory is revealed. Yes, we thank you, Father, for the privilege. We honor you that while we are still here, while America still shines, we will use this time and opportunity to proclaim you and to glorify your name. Yes. Help us to be faithful in that which you've given us now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.